So, lots of really good reasons to be thinking about how we best create wonderful, inclusive places in neighborhoods that are accessible, not just once a year for a holiday, but accessible every day for people who live in a community. Um, we want to ask if anybody's got any questions yet. Yeah, so um, let me see. Is somebody going to bring a microphone around, or can people just stand up and ask a question? Yeah, Lourdes, please. Thank you, Shirley. Um, so, uh, Lourdes Rodriguez, uh, Del Medical School, University of Texas, Austin, and Roundtable member. Um, so, before the December meeting in New York, maybe six years ago, there was another Federal Reserve meeting that brought together public health people and population health people and clinical people with developers. And the conversation went something like this. Developers, you have an opportunity to shape health. Developers respond, we can build clinics in the projects that we are building up. No, that's not how you do it. You need to think about you know, the public spaces. We don't know how to monetize that. So can you talk a little bit about how do you, part of the problem in shifting the investment is that you need to monetize was the return on investment in like creating a fantastic new space with great housing and great schools? How, how do you get the, the investors to con be convinced that there's a return on investment? Because it's not going to come back to their pockets. It's going to go somewhere else. It's a wrong pocket problem. So it's a good question. Um, so I, I, uh, I am married to a pediatrician who teaches at a public health uh, department uh, and at UC Berkeley. And... Uh, you would think I would be um, a quicker study because of that, because of our, con our dinner conversations. But I, literally, a decade went by when I still, when people said health, I thought medical care. Me too. Like I just, it's yep. just hard to break out of that. Yep. Yeah. It's very hard to break. So when they start talking about clinics, and the minute the p people go to a medical model, I mean that's that's on us. Well, we have to learn better. But you would be surprised how many people can speak eloquently. Jerome Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve System and an investment banker, most powerful person in, the, in, in economics, in the economy worldwide, speaks eloquently about the upstream social determinants of health. Like it's starting, it's, get, it's, it, it's getting in there, into the system, so that's a part of it. I always think that you need to find out who owns the downstream medical care cost risk and talk to them. Like for example, in Maui, Kaiser has about half the population are policyholders and they run all the hospitals. So they own about 80% of, so they have all the readmission risk, homelessness, mm -hmm. things like that are, are, are on the hospitals. So I just think there's like this Maui model somewhere where you're saying, when, when Kaiser realized that, they start talking about funding preschools because they knew that would help them, their bottom line. We will get there, but we're just chipping away at it. So I have no real answer, I apologize, but we're gonna get there, I promise. Yeah. So, so the public sector spends a lot of money on infrastructure. This is why I came back to that. We spend it on repaving streets, repairing bridges, building sidewalks. The, the question is whether the public sector is looking at um, partnering um, in some way that is a financial contribution. One of the big projects, the one that I named just because it's a big project, is the Atlanta Beltline, three and a half billion dollar project, which is all tax funded, it's tax funded money over 30 years, 30 years, I couldn't get it to 50, um, 30 years of an increment of taxes that's going to be invested in infrastructure that is trails and parks and physical infrastructure to attract pr pr private investment. So that the, so some of that is, and actually Robert Wood Johnson funded a study to look at what the health outcome, health outcomes would be on the development of this eight years ago before we turned to shovel. So some of this is attracting the public investment that's already going in. If you build a bridge, I mean in the Northeast it's one thing, if you build a bridge in the South, people assume only cars are going to go across. Whereas if you build a bridge in Austin, if you build a, a walkway around the river, I mean, there are lots of different ways. Um, if you're going to do uh, river evo er erosion control, you can build in a way that actually promotes healthy living, which should have healthy outcomes. So I would suggest that we've got to think about how the public sector 
can be an investor with existing dollars. I think a, a big part of it is partnerships in the way some of these deals are structured for developers. Um, I, and I, it's one of the things that I like about the purpose of the model is when, when, if you have this nonprofit partner, right, like our goal is not to get in here and get some huge monetary return on investment, right? And so we can take some of that risk, right, or we bring other resources that then make a deal pencil for kind of the brick and mortar person, right? So there's that. The other part of it is I think there needs to be kind of a collecting, a collective sort of easing of the rigidity around like these these kind of interventions, right? And when you call it an intervention, it sounds very prescriptive, and right? And so when you do talk to a developer, like I think a lot of times when they say, okay, well, we'll build a clinic, and they really mean it. They're like, great, we think that will help. And you, But it's because we're so rigid in the way that we look at it. If you look at childhood obesity stats for kids that go to Eastlake, or they go to Drew uh, Charter School in Eastlake. I don't know what the time frame was, and I should just let you talk about it, right? That's but good. Keep going. Um, but I was fascinated by the fact that the way the neighborhood was built had this statistically significant impact on childhood obesity. And everybody's sitting here digging into the numbers and trying to figure out what's going on. And then I think somebody just had a light bulb moment and said, oh, well, all these kids walk to school to and from every day, all year, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But if you're so rigid in your thinking about these interventions and, and so prescriptive, then you completely miss the opportunity or the understanding of how the built environment affects people's health without them even really understanding it, right? Kid gets out of bed, gets breakfast, walks to school every day. He's not, he or she's not thinking about how many steps. Well, my kids got Fitbit, so they are thinking about that. But, you know, it, it's a thing that becomes a part of life as opposed to, we have to fit this solution, you know, into this box. So I think just easing of that rigidity would help a lot as well. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, Jason Purnell, Washington University in St. Louis. I'm wondering how you think about both the legacy and the present day manifestations of residential segregation and the ways in which that organizes the distribution of resources. So, and the kind of, sociological truism that if a space is 30 40 percent african-american it's perceived as disorganized even by other african-americans so it's almost like how do you create enough critical mass uh, of investment while also dealing with deep-seated structural racism and the perceptions around race that still organize space in very real ways in the united states from, I mean, these, St. Louis is another great example. Like these are these these cities in the Midwest are the most segregated cities in the country, you know. And so Omaha is no different. Uh, St. Louis certainly has its own legacy with that. You know, when we think about that history, um, you know, we feel like the only way to kind of sort of combat that is how do we find ways and opportunities to return equity to to people from those communities, right? And one of the things that I love about sort of these large-scale community development projects is that if you are really intentional on the front end, it's like the gift that keeps giving in terms of opportunities to create wealth, opportunities to increase equity. But um, we were somewhere last year, uh, maybe at the Purpose Book Conference, and you really have to be so intentional uh, and start the process so early of thinking about that um, because you can get down the road in these projects and maybe you have missed $15 million worth of contracting opportunities for, you know, women-owned or minority-owned businesses because you weren't thinking about it two years before you broke ground. So, like, for us, one of the great lessons I've learned in this uh, has been, and I, I, I own a, a consulting firm as well, and so when we're, when I'm somewhere else, I'm always saying, get started now. Like, start to think about those opportunities that you have now well before you like you need to be thinking man this is really premature um, because it's not and you know if you're not started early you'll look back and you'll say there was 10 million dollars worth of opportunity that's just one segment of, of equity but there was 10 million dollars worth of opportunity that just slipped away right that we didn't do anything with that we didn't magnetize or, or uh, you know magnify or monetize for anybody else that's from that community so starting early was a huge like lesson for, for me and one of our, if I'm frank, one of our greatest laments. 
and that's also the reason I think you have to have residents, business. You've got to have all these sectors because some people are going to think longer term than others, and you have to find a way. To, and that's why 50 years, at, you know, 20 years is short term, really. 50, where, what do you want this to be like? Who is it serving? How is it serving people 50 years from now? Because the segregation or the discrimination and, and really just the hardship has existed for hundreds of years. So you, you, we're really chipping away at it. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. So I, I, I think that's really a good question. And there's a quick answer to it these days, which is troubling, and we all looked at each other, which is gentrification. The quick answer is, well, we're gentrifying. Well, the question is, do you need a mixed income neighborhood in order to survive 50 years from now? And there's some literature that might be worth reviewing on that point. <laughs> uh, and some people will say yes and some people will say no, but you've got to have that conversation. It's not what's happening right today, but where are the grandchildren of the people who are living there today going to be? Sure, can I jump real fast uh, to, to that group of people you need to get, you know, business and the community members, the visitor, you know, I'd add artists oh, yeah. as like we often overlook that, but we just did an event at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York with Art Place America on how can artists help kind of a community imagine because the investment's going to happen, but if it's not channeled properly by the community itself, it really, and I think artists do a good job of helping that sort of the use of imagination to make it possible. I mean, I'm a big fan of Rochetti's work and all the rest, but like this idea that you take Section 8 voucher kids and move them into other neighborhoods, well, what about the people who still live in that neighborhood, right? So, so we need to do both. It's a both and. And artists are often the pioneers who will go into neighborhoods that are underinvested. They're often the ones who go and, and live and work there. Uh, another question. Hi, I'm Pamela Russo from the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation, and my question was around this issue of uh, gentrification, displacement of the residents who were there. So the Beltline was very, very successful at, at getting investment and rebuilding, et cetera, but with some cost about displacement. So I wonder, from your perspective, how do you regulate? How do you, you know, how do you, how do you? Well, I thought that? I had, actually. Yeah, you did. No, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm then, being honest. But if I could just also ask Othello, so, you, I mean, in a purpose, or you, in a purpose-built community, you literally have to displace people to do the building. And no. how do you, well, temporarily, no. or they go away? So, what, or maybe I don't know, so tell me yeah. about that. Um, you, know, you know, in our case. Can I'm we sorry, just start with, there are two different things, gentrification and displacement. Those are two different things. So I think I would ask you to talk about both. <laughs> y yes, ma'am. <laughs> I know how to listen. <laughs> um, you know, all so uh, Purpose Builders in a bunch of different communities, and one of the things that I, I quickly realized is they're all very different. Um, you know, in our situation, uh, the projects had been torn down and people had been gone for, for years before we got started. So we came into, you know, kind of a, a, an urban prairie, literally. Um, other, other situations, I think about Birmingham, I think about um, Spartanburg, where it really is much more of an infill kind of weaving type development, right? Where you're not, you know, they don't have 40 acres of land like we do, right? They have... 10 parcels there, five over there, right? And so it's a much more, which is much more complicated, right? Because then you're trying to weave these different products in, uh, in a way that still feels cohesive with, with the, the neighborhood. You know, kind of as far as, so that's sort of what I see on the displacement side of it from the purpose-built perspective. Um, as far as the gentrification issue, um, this is one of those things that I talked about that is one of those those areas where there's great, uh, disagreement within the community itself, right? Within the people who are most affected by it. Uh, one of the things that I always remember, I had a conversation with Carol one time, and she said, "There's nothing worse uh, than paying for value that you created." <laughs> so, meaning you go in and you do something and say it's successful, and then you're trying to acquire property, uh, and you're paying the premium that you caused, that you created, right? Or other people are affected by that. So very early in our process, we bought every single 
tenth of an acre lot that we could. Everything we looked at it kind of like gentrification insurance, right? If we own, if we are the dominant landowner of stuff that people, and we didn't buy owner occupied, but if there were vacant, condemned, abandoned properties, we wanted to buy that and sort of be the voice for the community on that side of things, right? To ensure that, uh, to the greatest extent possible, there is um, um, accessibility and, and affordability going into the future. But one thing that is happening now in Omaha is, you know, people are coming to our neighborhood with suitcases full of cash. So they'll come with a suitcase and I have 25 grand in it and it'll be in small bills, so it'll look like a lot of money. And they'll go to somebody's house and say, you know, can I, I'll buy your house today, right? And um, the thing that we're talking about now is that's not illegal, right? And, and we, it may be distasteful. It may be, you know, underhanded. It may be whatever, right? But the idea of us stopping somebody from doing something that is completely legal versus saying how do we empower residents to share and the economic upside of an appreciating neighborhood to me needs to be that, that needs to be in the conversation like can we help folks in this neighborhood who maybe own their grandmother's house or they own their house share in the appreciation uh, that is going to happen to these neighborhoods whether we want to whether we want it to or not but we very rarely have that conversation it is always about let's stop the dude with the briefcase from knocking on doors which he has a constitutional right to go do right <laughs> So, um, but I like the way that the conversation is shifting. You know, uh, I think the, we, we know that gentrification can, in fact, be an agent of displacement. And if we're thoughtful and smart and well-resourced on, on the front end, we can protect the neighborhood. I loved Othello's term, gentrification insurance. That's a, you know, control the land, control your destiny. That's not always possible, but in many places it is. But, but we have to also realize that grinding poverty is a much more powerful agent of displacement. And we see it every day. We see it in student mobility rates at high poverty schools when there's a 40, 50, 60 percent annual student mobility rate. And if kids are moving that quickly, there's no way they're going to get a good education. There's no way a teacher can effectively educate a class. So all these things are connected. And I think we have to be more nuanced and more sophisticated in our thinking about all these powers and all these issues that are at play in neighborhoods. And I think part of this conversation today will be about the role that public places can play in, in people wanting to stay in a community, giving them a reason to stay in a community other than just I, I can't live anyplace else. But why is a place a good place to plant my flag? for my family and I. And part of that might be a really wonderful, inclusive public place that, to David's point, creates opportunities for people across their lifespan to be connected with one another, to take care of themselves, and have a really wonderful opportunity at building relationships and enjoying the serendipity of life. I, w I, I want to say at the Olympics, one of the community meetings, the the this community was probably 97% African American, um, had lost about 50% of its population 10 or 15 years before. Uh, in those community meetings, the people who live there, largely um, poorly educated in a, poor, in a poorly educated population of Georgia, the bottom line was they didn't want any more poor people in their neighborhood. They told me they wanted middle-class families. They wanted single-family households. That's the reason you got to have all the folks at the table so that you look way out. I mean, we had many, many, many discussions about whether we would build any multifamily units in that house, in that community. 700 vacant properties. You could build all, some of them adjacent, some of them able to build multifamily. This is a very complicated issue. Do you know what we ended up agreeing on? 700 single family for sale households because the community demanded it. And they were, they wanted to be in a mixed income community, not in a community with concentrated poverty. So this is a lot more complicated than I expected it to be when I started the work <laughs> 30 years ago. We are just about out of time. Anybody, uh, another comment before we, we go? I think your point about mobility is 
really critical. I, I, I didn't think about it until you just said that about the kids in our neighborhood, how often they move, and that is a direct function of poverty. Like, I'm going to move over here because it's $10 cheaper, or I'm going to move over here because it's safer. But I think that is a really uh, a well taken point. Well, th thank you all. It's great to be with you. Thank you for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.